All right. Uh, it is a great, great honor to be asked to present at the symposium honoring Warner. Um, and I thought I would begin by uh, sharing a little bit about my time as a trainee in his lab. Okay, so I joined Warner's lab in 2007 as a postdoc, and uh, Warner taught me everything I needed to know about HIV. <laughs> now, I find this uh, archive photo um, a bit amusing because it shows him teaching me signs by staring at red colored water in a petri dish. <laughs> so, no, that's not the extent to which Warner had mentored me, but in fact, he um, graciously involved me in a number of projects to better understand HIV transmission through the female reproductive tract, which has implications for microprobicide development. And he also mentored me through a project that eventually led me to identify these natural factors in human seminal plasma that greatly promote HIV infection. And these same factors may also play a role in male fertility, specifically sperm biology. Now, at the end of the presentation, I'll come back to the things that Warner has taught me. But before that, I thought I would share a little bit about some of the work that my lab has been pursuing in recent years, well after I had quote unquote graduated from being um, a trainee in his lab. Okay, so the story I'll share um, begins about five years ago when we set out to address the rather fundamental question of amongst a diverse population of CD4 positive T cells represented here as the colored circles, which ones are the ones that are most susceptible to HIV infection? And we use as a source of cells those from tonsils because tonsils naturally harbor a subpopulation of CD4 positive T cells that are permissive to HIV in the absence of ex vivo stimulation. And so our experimental design was relatively straightforward. We um, exposed these cells to a CCR5 tropic HIV reporter virus and then analyzed these infected cells as compared to an unaffected control using a technology known as CYTOF. And so CYTOF is just a single cell protein quantitation tool that is analogous to flow cytometry, but where many more parameters can be simultaneously monitored. And so shown here are the results of our CYTOF data sets. Um, and so uh, I, I'm depicting the data in the form of TISNI plots. A TISNI is simply a two-dimensional depiction of high-dimensional data. In this case, this is 40-dimensional CYTOF data. And in the TISNI, each dot generally corresponds to one cell, and cells closer together in high-dimensional space, they appear closer closer together on this two-dimensional plot. And so you can start seeing these various clusters of cells uh, forming in the uninfected sample. Now, interestingly, when we look at the infected cells, we see something very different, where you can see most of the infected cells occupy a unique region of the TISNI that's not occupied by cells in the uninfected sample. And so we have a name for this phenomenon. We call it viral-induced remodeling. And these cells here are considered remodeled because they've adopted a phenotype that's completely distinct from anything in the original uninfected culture. And so these results suggest that this diagram I had showed earlier is not that accurate because it's not the case that these infected cells are simply a subset of the starting population, but rather they've changed a bit. And so I've represented this change by a slight color change here. And this here is in the context of the Tisneys, which I showed earlier. But our original question was, of course, what are the features of these cells that are preferentially susceptible to HIV infection? So how do we get that information? And so this is where the high dimensional nature um, of CYTOP data sets comes in handy, where essentially we can uh, predict the original features of this cell. And so together with my former uh, colleague, Marielle Cavoin, who's here, um, we developed this approach called predicted precursor as determined by SLIDE, or PP SLIDE for short, where we can essentially predict the original features of the cells targeted for HIV infection. And the way the approach works as follows, um, what we do is we consider these cells um, from the uninfected sample that we've analyzed by CYTOF as the atlas of all the different types of uninfected CD4 T cells that are present in that sample. And then we take the high dimensional information from the infected cells and match it against this atlas to identify the phenotypically most similar cells. And those cells serve as the predicted phenotype of the original cells targeted for HIV infection. And so we call these cells here the predicted precursor cells, predicted because we're predicting their original phenotypes, and precursors because they are the direct precursors to these infected cells. And this approach generally works because although HIV infection will change the phenotype of a cell, it won't change it so much so that that cell completely loses its original identity. And in this approach, which we published back in 2017, we validated by demonstrating that subsets of cells predicted to be more susceptible were indeed more susceptible when sorted out ahead of time and then subsequently infected with our reporter virus. <laughs> 
And we looked not only at tonsil cells, but also at cells from a variety of other sites, including the female reproductive tract. And this is particularly significant because these cells are typically the first to become infected during HIV transmission to women. And what we found in this study, which we published a couple of years ago, was that um, memory CD4 positive T cells from the female reproductive tract are highly susceptible to HIV infection. And within the memory compartment, we also see selection of subsets. In particular, we find that T effector memory cells and T resident memory cells are preferentially selected for infection, while central memory cells are preferentially spared. And this is established by determining the proportions of each of these subsets within the uninfected population versus the predictive precursor population. And more recently, we've um, expanded beyond looking just at protein antigens to also looking at glycans. And so there are many different types of glycans out there, and they serve not only as useful biomarkers, but can also inform on mechanisms of human diseases. And in this study, which we published uh, last year, um, Tong Sui Ma in my lab developed this uh, approach called Cytoflec. Lec is short for lectins, and lectins are proteins that bind specific glycans. And what Tong Sui did was she conjugated these lectins to metal lanthanide so that at the same time as phenotyping for protein antigens by Cytof, we can also look at glycan features. And what we found was that um, um, HIV preferentially targets CD4 T cells with particular glycan features for infection. Um, in particular, if uh, preferentially like to infect cells with high levels of fucose and high levels of sialic acid. Now, in terms of validating these findings, it turns out that previously um, it's already been reported that uh, cells with high levels of fucose are preferentially targeted for uh, HIV infection. This was actually demonstrated by our close collaborator, uh, Mohammed Abdel Mohsen at the WISTAR. But to our knowledge, it hadn't been previously reported that cells with high levels of sialic acid are preferentially targeted for HIV infection. So we went about to validate this, and to do that, what we did was we sorted memory CD4 positive T cells into three bins containing high, intermediate, or low levels of sialic acid, and then we exposed these cells to the same amount of virus, and what you can see is that the cells with the highest levels of sialic acid were infected at the highest rates, while those with the lowest levels of sialic acid were infected at the lowest rates. And as expected, the total memory CD4 positive T cells were infected at an intermediate rate. And so these results were quite interesting because it suggested first that um, the expression levels of a single glycan, sialic acid, can distinguish memory CD4 positive T cells with vastly different susceptibilities to HIV infection. But it was also interesting because it turns out that sialic acid can afford immuno evasion from NK cell recognition. So this may also be a mechanism for HIV to avoid detection by various effector immune cells. Now, we've also applied this cytof pb slide approach not only in the context of in vitro studies, but also to characterize the in vivo reservoir from art-suppressed individuals living with HIV. Now, as many of you know, the latent reservoir is the main barrier to an HIV cure, and there are a number of reasons why it's been so difficult to target or, lit or eliminate this reservoir, one being that as a field, we still don't have a great understanding of what types of cells in vivo harbor latent HIV. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that uh, there is no universal cell surface biomarker that can distinguish these cells from regular uninfected cells. And so what this means is that typically when you want to characterize these latent cells, you get cells from an art suppressed individuals, and then you have to stimulate the cells ex vivo. And what the stimulation will do is it will cause some of the latent cells to start producing viral proteins. And these cells, now called a reactivated cell, can be identified and deeply characterized at the single cell level using approaches such as Cytoff. But of course, the reactivated cell isn't the same as the original latent one, and there are two main sources of the change. One is that we've stimulated the cells ex vivo, so you'll have, for example, upregulation of a lot of activation molecules. But the second reason is, um, as I mentioned earlier, HIV replication within the cell will also change its phenotypes. And so how do we overcome this issue of the cells which we actually can identify and characterize being different from the cells which we um, actually want to characterize these original latent cells? And so as you might imagine, we're applying the same principles behind Cytoff PP slide, which we previously applied in the context of these in vitro studies, but now we're applying it in the context of the in vivo reservoir. And so to try to illustrate this as clearly as possible, I'm going to illustrate it in the context of an analogy. And that analogy will be facial recognition, more specifically how someone's look changes over time. 
And so to illustrate this analogy, I show here two photographs of Sean Connery, one which I will refer to as the James Bond years of Sean Connery, and then this one here I'll refer to as the post-James Bond years. Um, and, and the uh, analogy here is that the original one corresponds to the, oh, sorry. You don't have to see that yet. <laughs> I clicked too fast. <laughs> the original one corresponds to the uh, latent one, and the, uh, uh, the older one corresponds to the reactive activated one. But because we're here honoring Warner, I can't just continue with this, which is what I typically do. So I'm going to change things up a bit, right? So I will call this here the mustache years of Warner. <laughs> And then I'll call this the post-mustache years of Warner, okay? So the analogy is obviously the post-mustache years are the reactivated cells, the mustache years are the latent cell. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have this information on the right-hand side, but the information we want is here on the left-hand side. So how do we get that information? Um, and so, you know, we apply the principles behind Cytoff PP slide, and essentially what we first do is we generate an atlas of all the different types of unstimulated CD4 positive T cells that are present in that sample. And then we take the high-dimensional information here and match it against every component of this atlas to identify the phenotypically most similar cell. And that's that one right there. <laughs> and, and so that serves as a predictive phenotype of the original cell targeted for latent infection. And so this is one of the first participant samples that we analyzed in this manner, where we first generated an atlas of all the unstimulated memory CD4 positive T cells from that sample. And then we took the remaining cells and we stimulated for 40 hours with PMA on mice. And in this sample, we were able to identify 20 reactivated cells. They are stacked all on top of one another here. And they're in a unique uh, region of the TSD, consistent with the notion that reactivation will change the phenotype of the cell. And then we um, take the information here, and we map it against the atlas, and now we've identified what we call KNN latent cells. We call them KNN latent cells because a KNN algorithm was used for the mapping. And this here is the overlay. And we've done a lot of work characterizing the phenotypic features of these latent cells, including the subsets and clusters to which they belong. And importantly, we've validated these findings by demonstrating that cell surface proteins preferentially expressed on the latent cells, when used for sorting, we can enrich for the replication competent HIV reservoir. And so if you're interested um, in you know, learning more about this, I encourage you to um, check out this paper, which we published a couple of years ago. And I'll also mention that we're continuing to use this approach right now to characterize the tissue reservoir from a variety of different sites throughout the human body, as well as in the context of uh, various um, cure-based HIV clinical trials. And just to acknowledge the folks that did the work, so um, Tung Tsui Ma in my lab was the one that developed the Cytophilic panel, and uh, Jason Neidelman um, in my lab, um, together with Xiaoyu Lo and she was in Warner Green's lab, was the one that developed the, um, the, the uh, Cytophilic slide approach for characterizing the in vivo reservoir. I also want to um, especially acknowledge uh, Marielle Cavois. We had come up with the Cytophilic slide approach um, a number of years ago through our discussions. Okay, so I began the presentation by sharing um, a bit about the science that Warner has taught me, but in fact, Warner has taught me a lot beyond just science. So many of you um, probably know that Warner is a very um, adamant and talented golfer, whereas I've never golfed before. And I remember during my first week as a postdoc in his lab, he asked me whether I played golf. And I made the mistake of saying no, but I play mini golf. And he just gave me this look. <laughs> and I thought I was gonna be fired on my first week on the job. <laughs> but he didn't fire me, but I did learn to not assume that mini golf is like real golf. Um, um, some of you probably also know that Warner likes nice cars. And I actually had never sat in a Porsche until my postdoc interview with Warner when he drove me to the interview dinner. And I, I realized that these cars are kind of low and I was in a full suit with heels. It was actually challenging for me to get out of the car, but I learned how to do that. <laughs> And I think some of you probably also know that Warner isn't the biggest fan of sushi. So I learned over the years of being in his lab to never suggest a sushi restaurant as a place for a lab dinner. No, but, but in all seriousness, I actually did learn a lot beyond science um, from Warner, and I want to mention some of that. So, um, you know, as Roma's already said, and all, all of us um, know, he's an excellent speaker. And from him, I've learned to communicate effectively, not only to scientists, but also to the wider community. Warner had always emphasized the importance of striving for the best. He always liked to say, never settle for B-level science, only pursue A-level science, and that's something that I've very, very much taken to heart. 
Um, he has taught me how to deal with the ups and downs that come with being a scientist. And finally, he has been a wonderful mentor and I've tried to emulate him in that regard. And so thank you, Warner, for everything. Um, congratulations. And I look forward to celebrating with you today. Thank you.